So without further ado, I'd love to welcome onto the stage the internationally acclaimed award-winning director, Chloe Lewins, Mariam Ali, and Hannah Ali. Before we begin, I, I'd just like to say, I, I watched the film last night and I loved it. I was so, so touched right from, right from the very beginning, right from those first pieces of audio that you hear, those first images that you see. Um, and it, it's moving, it, it's, it's Ali, but in a way that we haven't seen him necessarily uh, on screen. There has been a lot, there's been a lot of films. What makes this different? <laughs> um, I think that this film, obviously, you know, Claire took a, different, a very personal approach and so much has been done on our father, but no one's ever actually really focused on him as the man and the father. And um, she, she focused a lot on this, his family, his children and, and that aspect. And, uh, and then on top of that, she used a lot of footage to tell a story that we, we, most people take for granted that they've, they've, they've heard or learned. But we, we were watching footage that we had never seen before. And different different stories in the film. Um, we didn't know the behind the, the, what went on behind the scenes, like the Esquire shoot, the famous shoot that he had. So we learned a lot. And you know, May May. I mean, like Hannah said, all the documentaries of my father have been about the sport, social activism. This documentary covered all those things. But the father, he has nine children, and he adores all nine children. And most um, journalists and filmmakers really don't tap into that. So I just think it's a real comprehensive expression of him and um, it really exudes his his uh, personality his spirit his soul it just comes right off the screen so and a lot of people what they get out of this film we it's been surprising that grown men will come out crying saying wow the relationship between the father and the daughter or the, the you know the father and the child is like nothing I've ever seen about an athlete so Claire did a phenomenal job Claire why why did you choose to do this job how did the wheels get set in motion how did it come about um, well, I, a while ago, I did a series for the BBC about th um, the best friend of people like Che Guevara and Muhammad Ali and Mick Jagger. And I always thought out of all those people, there was something really special about Muhammad Ali, just something just really surprising. And I just thought if I could actually get to the people who knew him really well when uh, in the inner circle, I could maybe find out what makes him so special. And am I right in thinking that this all sort of began out of his birthday party, his 70th birthday party? Well, I met um, Jean Kilroy, Ali's former business manager, as part of the series for the BBC, as I described. But um, he then said, well, Muhammad Ali is going to be 70, and why don't you come over and film his birthday party? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. She was actually working on the film a lot longer than that. That's yeah. when I met her. And uh, that's, when I, that's where I did my first interview with her. Um, and she filmed, I think she interviewed me th three times. And that was the first one, and that's when she was introduced to the audio recordings. But I think 75% of your film was pretty done, wasn't it? Well, I, I'd actually, by then I sort of been interviewing people like Mike Tyson and George Foreman, but um, the audio recordings were something I discovered that Han had. So you didn't realize that the audio recordings existed? No, I was making the film without that yeah. anyway, because I, I thought if I could just get to the inner circle, then I'd have a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And the sort of the audio, but, but one, one thing that, I really felt was important was to have Muhammad Ali's voice present through the film. And when I found out that you had this audio oh recording, that became me. Um. No, I know, but it wasn't an, e it wasn't an easy fish to land, believe you, me. Um, yeah. Trying try to persuade her uh, to let me yeah. use some of them. I had all these visions, you know, I was going to make a documentary, I'm working on a book, because there's like 90 hours of recordings that span like six, seven years when he, was, when he stopped boxing. So it was hard giving him up at first, but she showed me a clip of what she was doing, and it was done so beautifully and so well, and it had so much feeling and heart and just the spirit of my father in that little clip. I thought it was amazing. So, yeah. your your audio recordings make up what I would say it's kind of the spine uh, of the film, and it's interesting because when I first saw them sort of coming onto the screen, you don't even realize that there's no there's nothing there's no moving pictures, there's nothing to see because you're so engrossed in his voice. It's so impacting. Do you remember that from growing up, him, him having such command in his voice? Yeah, I mean, my, my dad loved to tape and record us. I mean, he, he, had, he, loved, he was fascinated by time and how fleeting it was and history. And I mean, for him to be such a worldly figure and to really um, understand the importance of small moments with his children. And so we remember, I remember almost every recording in this in the film. I saw, oh my God, I remember that conversation with him. So 
We knew he loved that. He loved history, yeah. personal history. He, he recorded us going to school and talking to the teachers when we yeah. were in third grade, Layla and I, and uh, you know, talking to the boys we had crushes on. He recorded <laughs> my mom on the telephone talking to his mother and his father talking about his childhood and talking, you know, recording. Uh, he just recorded everything, you know, just it was amazing. Do you remember him recording? And, and did you ever ask why? Did you know why? I remember I had those recordings of myself you know, at two and three and saying, let me hold that thing, give me that thing and trying to snatch it out of his hand. Or I want, I want you to take this upstairs and let my mom hear me talking on this thing. So I, I remember certain things, but it was amazing to then have him give them to, give them to us and to, to listen to them and learn about all the other things that were going on in his life personally around the times when we were just three, four, five, six, seven years old playing around him on the floor, the things that he was struggling with, the decisions to come back to fight again and you know, trying to free hostages in Iran. The government's calling him because his name opened the lines of communication to the hostage crisis in 1979. And he's trying to prepare his speeches to the Ayatollah Khomeini to free the hostages. And he's recording all of that. He's recording, talking to different celebrities and playing practical jokes on different people, calling Joe Frazier, wishing him a happy Merry Christmas. and trying to convince George Foreman to come out of retirement, which he retired after he lost my father depressed, trying to convince him to come back to the ring and fight under him at his camp that he was trying to, you know, all the plans he had for himself before the Parkinson set in. So it's, it's, it's amazing that, to hear all of that stuff that I didn't know about. Yeah. yeah. It's very good that he recorded all of that. Uh, as well as the recordings, we have a lot of archive footage, uh, lots of personal pictures. How long did it take to gather all this together to, to create the film? Well, it took, um, it took a long time, actually, because there was just so much of it. And um, the editor and I would just sit and watch stuff, and then we'd forget that we were meant to be working. <laughs> we were just, like, watching loads of footage of him and how incredibly funny he was and how incredibly sometimes really brash and just incredibly naughty some of the time, you know, and the things he'd be saying to the other boxers and things he'd be saying behind the scenes. And, but every time, it doesn't matter how good the interviews are, you know, there's, there's some really fantastic interviews in the film, which is nothing to do with me, it's just the people were good. But every time Muhammad Ali comes on the screen, you just want to watch him. I mean, he's just a compelling. Yeah. So actually, it shouldn't. It took longer than it should have done because we kept just. We were enjoying the process. I remember she told me it was three hours. At one point, she was like, "Oh my God, we we have to edit this down. The movie's three hours long." <laughs> it was. I just didn't want. It. And then the directors are really weird people anyway, and you just think, "Oh, it's perfect like this. Don't let's change anything." And so we had to be quite ruthless and take things out. And we actually was, you know, not taking out some quite important people yeah. from the story because we just had to. You know, you couldn't sit in the cinema for three days. And as a voyage of discovery and still finding all of this new material that you could throw into it, presumably that made it difficult to storyboard because you don't necessarily know what you're working with from the outset. Well, I, I, when I was interviewing the people, I just wrote down, OK, this is the, the, the trainer's story. This is the manager's story. And I just did that as a shorthand in my notebook. And then I thought, actually, this works as a device because it simplifies everything rather than it just being talking heads. And every person I interviewed, it's almost like in the edit, I had to, they had to hand the baton over to someone else. So somebody like Angelo Dundee would describe what he was like uh, as a boxer and how he would, you know, he just loved to work hard and that, you know, youthful ex exuberance of him. And that would pass on to someone else who'd tell you something else. And then it would pass on to Mei Mei, who told him what he was like as a father. So uh, in a way, the film kind of just created itself. The, the flow isn't necessarily even chronological all the no. way through, but you're right, that, that sort of flow, it's all about character. It's all about how the dynamics of his character. Was there anything that you did discover that you hadn't known before? I mean, I, the story, uh, the backstory behind Esquire magazine, um, where he's posed as a, a martyr, a Christian martyr, I didn't, I didn't know the backstory on how they had to call Elijah Muhammad to get permission for a Muslim to pose as a Christian. Um, I, that was funny to me. Um, I remember that the book cover came out in 68 when I was born. Um, and I remember the cover. I loved it, but I didn't know the backstory. So, And more details about the, uh, Jim, Jim, the meeting Jim Brown when he gathered all the black athletes and when my father refused going to the Vietnam War. They wanted to know if he was sincere in his convictions. And they had a meeting. And I, rem I knew about the meeting, but... Uh, um, Jim Brown talked more in detail about, because I didn't know that they were trying to see if he was being sincere. I thought they were automatically supporting him. And then, you know, through Claire's film, I found out, oh, they were testing him to see if he was sincere about being a Muslim and not going to Vietnam. So those two things were uh, something new for me. Uh, I, I want to ask you a little bit more about um, growing up with, with your father in the limelight and also about uh, you, whether you remember him losing his crown because he, he refused to go to the Vietnam War. But, but first, we have a clip to play, uh, the, the, the father's story, which is apt, very apt. <laughs> 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 
Now, the two of you obviously have uh, different mothers, but Muhammad Ali was very keen for you to know each other, to be brought up knowing each other. How did that work? Well, every summer he flew, you know, um, all of our sisters in to our house in Los Angeles where Leila and I lived. And Mia, Kalia, the twins, Jamila Rashida, May May, um, Muhammad Jr., everyone flew in. And I mean, we, it was like the time of our lives. So Leila and I were like three, four, five, six, you know, we grew up in the summers. So he made it a, a point that we it always taught us to love each other and, and that we were, he loved us all equally. And to, he wanted us to grow up to be friends and we did. You know, because he brought us together. Yeah, you know, you know, they always talk about athletes and all those, you know, the kids and different women. And it's, I just think, you know, for him to be such a world traveler, an iconic figure, for him to make that was so important to him for all his children with all the different wives. So he would say, you know, this is your blood. Love your sisters and brothers. I know families that are they have their whole sisters and brothers, or they're not even that close. So, I mean, just things like that. He he just, you know. And you know, some of the you know the wives didn't like each other. I mean, but he didn't want us to be involved in that. And he just that was so important for all nine children to really love each. And we all do. We're all friends. We all get together. We hang out. Um, you know, so it, it's I think that's remarkable just as a man to to find that so important. You know, and it wasn't easy. I mean, he you know he was married four times, so it wasn't easy to do, but he did it. But most people don't know this. My father has two half brothers. He has one full brother, and he just discovered that himself in the '90s when he went to his father's funeral. And um, it's what he didn't want to happen to us to to grow up one day and find out we had a sister or a sibling that we don't know. Right. So you know, it's sad that it had to happen to him. Um, but he found out he had two, he had two twin brothers that, that they were twins, but they they were with his by his father and another woman. And he only learned of their existence, like I said, is when he went to their, his father's funeral. So um, that happens a lot, you know. People have, you know, the mothers don't want you to come together, and they don't want the kids at their house. My mother was always very opening and welcoming. She didn't meddle and cause any problems, you know, with him and his his family, other families coming and and just bonding with her children. So that was good. Claire, you very much present Muhammad Ali as a father figure. That's probably, I thought anyway, the most prominent way in which he is is depicted uh, and in a way that we've, we've never really seen before. Did it ever jar for you as a child, um, this idea that he, he is your dad and he's incredibly loving? You say throughout the film, he's, he's so loving, he was so caring, he was a joker, he was a pra practical joker. But you knew the reason he was famous was for fighting. Was that ever a confusing notion no. to you? Fighting is a sport, you know, it's not a, it's not a, um it's a sport. You learn it. It's a skill set. So it's, it's a dignified sport. It's not no different than football. You know, when they get injured and concussions, and you know they're killing themselves at the end of a, a career because they're they're all messed up. So it's you know, my father used to hate when people demonize boxing because he would say, "Look at race car driving. People blow up in cars." So it, no, it wasn't confusing. He was a very serious, disciplined athlete. And not just. A, you know, vicious not, fighter, you know. Not just that, but some people enjoy fighting and hurting people. My dad doesn't. Yeah. He wasn't known for being a hard hitter or hitting people when they fell down. Like the most, you know, memorable f punch of the one of his famous, most famous fights with Joe Frazier and Zaire is when, Ver Ger I'm, I'm sorry, not Joe Frazier, um, George Foreman is when he was going down and he didn't hit him again, you know? Yeah. So he used restraint and he, he was a boxer. He wouldn't, I wouldn't call him a fighter. He was a boxer. <laughs> he had an art form to what he did. But you mean, like Layla, for example, enjoys fighting. She doesn't, she's retired now, but she enjoyed fighting. My father was more about the, like, you know, the art of the sport. Yeah. And also like Joe yeah. Frazier, we know him personally, teddy bear guy, George Foreman, nice guy, Sweet, Kenny yeah. Norton, nice guy. Matter of fact, Hannah's best friend, friends with Kenny Norton's daughter, and we're all good friends with George Foreman's daughter. And all, they were really big boxers who are very sweet men, but they just loved the Love sport they were Love to hug and kiss. In. I mean, most men yeah. have a problem showing that side of their affection. My father, he'd make me ask for directions before oh, yeah. I'm lost. He, you know, he, he's He'll always cry hugging and kissing and loving, even with his son, you know, so <laughs> he's not shy. He's not, he's not, you know, embarrassed very by it. Emotional. He's very secure with himself and showing all aspects of his, his personality and his spirit. And at what point mm -hmm. did you realize growing up? Did it, did it hit you? My dad is kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. I, pretty, I, have pretty two, I knew he was famous <laughs> when I was a little girl because people were everywhere and celebrities would come to the house and all that. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand the significance and the impact he had on people until around 13. We were at a diner. Caucasian man comes up to the diner. I love you, Ali. My father said, come on, eat with us. He said, you know, I had to denounce what my family taught me because they were KKK, racist, and I followed your career and I loved you and you were a black man. 
and I, I, I just couldn't believe in that anymore because of you. And he, man start crying, my dad start crying, I start crying. And the mm. guy walked away and I'm like, wow, you really mm. impact everyone. I mean, I, that's why I knew he was more than just a boxer, was that moment in time. I was like, and then, you know, people walk up to us all the time and say what Muhammad Ali meant to them. Mm. And it, sometimes it brings us to tears. And, or people just come, you know, they, they, when I was a little girl, I, my first memory of my just being impressed and was when I was like three or four, maybe, and we were go, we were in the, we spent a lot of time in airports, and we would be my father would be rushing down the airport in the halls trying to get the, uh, catch our plane, and all the people would just stop and applaud. And I remember feeling them vibrating in my chest, and them saying, "We love you," you know, "Thank you," and just thanking him. And I'm thinking, "Who is this man?" I remember looking at him and just thinking, like looking him up and down. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of crying and getting emotional, Claire, were there any times when you were interviewing um, the contributors for this film where you found yourself overcome by, by the story, by what you were hearing? Well, I think there's a story when Jean Kilroy talks about the boy with leukemia who was um, a dear late Pennsylvania, a little boy that came to the camp. And Jean told me that story before, but then he found the actual photograph of the little boy, and that, I can't even want to talk about it, it's just so unbelievably poignant the fact that little boy was so delighted to meet your father and you know tell, told him he was gonna tell God he'd met him and everything yeah. it was just really sad yeah. but also um, just I think I was blown away by you know even people like Marvis Fraser now if he's got any reason to have a beef with your father you know because of the whole history the whole bad backstory and yet when he was saying or oh, they came together and sort of at the end you know made a friendship yeah. and that was really moving really because it's out of Wow! Out of that enemy, they, they yeah. sort of they, they resolved it. A lot of people didn't know it wasn't only it was one sided. My father always loved Joe Frazier, so he did what he did with all the fighters. Only Joe Frazier took it to heart when he was trying to publicize and the, boast the fights, you know, promote the fights. Joe Frazier and his children had a hard time, and when he found that out, it just brought him to tears, you know, and it really hurt, broke his heart. So it, for a long time, Joe Frazier would shun my father and would turn his back on him. I remember when I first learned of it, I was like 14 or 15 years old, and they were at an autograph signing. And my dad saw Joe, his eyes lit up. He jumped up, Joe, Joe, come over here. Like he tried, tried to start shadow boxing. And Joe Frazier looked at him and just sort of and kept walking. And I thought, I turned to my stepmother and said, why did he do that to daddy? You know, so that's when I first learned about that. And then later my father found out that he was really hurt by what happened. And he literally just put his head down and cried. Yeah. There's the, that beautiful image of the, the two of them uh, hand in hand yeah. when they'd, they'd made up. Um, <laughs> my personal emotional moment was pretty much at the beginning of the film. <laughs> it was a lost cause after that. Um, yeah. Rahman Ali, his brother. Oh, yeah. What a beautiful relationship. Uh, he talks about how they grew up together, how they were so close as little boys. And it's the beginning of the story of this 12-year-old boy, this 87-pound 12-year-old boy who had his bike stolen and decided he wanted to fight to get it back. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a moment. We've got a clip of the brother's story. The executive director of the... Well, that was the, the black athletes meeting. Yeah. Um, that, that wasn't actually that the, wasn't brother. the brother. I, I think <laughs> I think they may have logged that down like sort of like civil rights brother. But brothers yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. As, as a group. <laughs> as a uh, but that actually does does yeah. take me on to, to talk about when uh, he was stripped of his title. He refused to go uh, to to the Vietnam War. Do you remember that? Well, I was born at that time. I was born when he was in exile, so I don't, I don't remember that because I was just too young. But I. I've studied it, I've talked to him about it, and you know, I, I think that's one of the main reasons he's so well known. I think that's when he really went international because that news went everywhere, went abroad. Um, he was this Muslim in America, in the nation of Islam at the time. There are Muslims all over the world, so it really put a spotlight on this country, America, and, and my dad, and what was going on with that. So I think that was his first international real mark, you know when people start knowing who is this Muhammad Ali person who's, who's defying the American government and that he was put on the map when that happened. He didn't do that to be put on the map. He really was going to give up. And I think that's another thing, the fact that he was going to give up a potential fortune, his career, his title, because of that belief system. Um, just people, some people, most, a lot of people hated him for it and still do, um, but a, a lot of people adored him for it. And he actually did give it up because for four four years, three and a half years, but it he had been nothing permanent. and didn't know, yeah. especially in those yeah, times, that they were going to overturn it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? but actually, but one of the things I'd right like now. to say is that he was incredibly fond of 
Britain. I mean, because when he refused the draft and everything, we, s I mean, not me, because I wasn't, I was, well, I probably was a thought, but, uh, you know, the, the British people stood by him and, and, and didn't actually, they didn't, they still kept his heavyweight champion and, you know, they didn't mm. take that away from him. So I think he was always incredibly fond yeah, of he always, this They really love me there. Every time yeah. I come there, they receive me so well. <laughs> he loves After it. After that first time when, where uh, there's a part, apparently he talks too much for British people. We weren't too keen on that, but we got used. <laughs> um, you, you picked out one particular fan, one British fan, a Geordie man, I like that from Newcastle, uh, Russ Rutledge. Yes, he was just extraordinary. He had, he ba basically the story of Russ was uh, um, when he was about 16 years old, he came to the Albert Hall. And I think your father was in a show match or something. And as your dad was leading the ring, he grabbed a hold of his arm and your dad said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm just a, such a fan, I'm such a fan. And after that, he wrote to him yeah. every day for years and years and one day he put his telephone number on it and then he was watching he was at home with his mum and his friends and they were watching a pirated copy which I shouldn't say in front of people <laughs> from Universal but anyway um, a pirated copy of Rumble in the Jungle and his mum goes Russ 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 it's Mohammed Ali on the phone and she thought he was just mess messing around and then she said no it really is him and then he said Russ and he said oh guess what I'm watching you on Rumble in the Jungle yeah. and your dad said who won <laughs> which I thought was quite funny, <laughs> funny. but um, and then he invited him to go and stay with him in LA and that footage that he took Russ he's never shown anyone before it's 30 years old and it, that's in the film so that's all completely brand new archive really he did that a lot actually mm. if you if you were a fan and you sent my father your number he would call you back <laughs> He got hung up on a lot, yeah. so he stopped telling people who he was. He actually re records it. Like, he would wake up on Christmas, and you know he's Muslim. He doesn't really celebrate Christmas, but he knew the world did. So he would get out his phone book and just pick a random numbers. Merry Christmas! This is Muhammad <laughs> Ali, and people would just hang up on him. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> yeah. I would do that too. <laughs> he loved it. Yeah, he yeah. loved it. He loved to shock people and make them feel good. So, mm. I mean, he he did that for a long time, and it got harder for him to speak over the years. So he'd have me dial the numbers. So when I was in Michigan with my dad, we were going through his fan mail. He's like, call the number back. And I'm like, hello, this is Han Ali. My father's here. He's reading your fan mail. He'd like to say hi to you. I'm like, are you kidding me? He, you know, it's amazing how famous he was and how often he was recognized. But it, that always tripped him out, people noticing him. Like, we'll be in the car, and he'll just put the window down and say, look at this. You know, he got a kick out of that. He just thought it was the funniest. He liked to shock people and, you know, for, to scare people. And he'll yeah. put the window down. I'm yeah. the greatest. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. You know, this, yeah. one, this one guy's riding a bike next to the limo and he pulls the window book. He goes, I'm the greatest guy. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, Lord, I almost hurt that man. He, even now with all of the press about him dying, he doesn't get upset about that. He just says, did I make the front page? <laughs> So yeah, he's, he's happy he's, the world still talks about him. He's you know, doing they good. They still remember me? I'm like, of course, they'll always remember you. <laughs> one thing that Russ says that really stands out is uh, you spend one moment with Muhammad Ali mm. and it stays with you forever. That one moment, yeah. no matter how short it was. Yeah. I mean, to what extent? And, and how, how does a man have that impact? Well, my father genuinely loves people like he needs air to breathe. Yeah. And he loves making people feel good about themselves. You know, it doesn't matter who you are, our cook, the mailman, you're the greatest mailman, you deliver mail faster than anybody else in the world. That's what he would tell him. Or you're the best cook, no one in the world cooked me this, the food this good. You know, if he goes to a crowd, he always looks for the people that look like they're shying and may, you might not notice and he points them out and he'll, so he'll wink and, you know, he just loves, loves you people. You can meet people today and, and someone may be a different class than you and you can tell they're not paying attention to you. You know, yeah. they're looking over you. Yeah. But my father gave you his attention. Yeah. He didn't care, you know, if you were rich or, you know, if you came up to him he looked at you and dealt with you and you just even today we're on our cell phones or we're so we're you know we're so connected but we're so disconnected mm -hmm. and I, I think that's what he meant he he connected with everyone he always um, made you feel important and he didn't overlook yeah. you because you weren't and he loves average people yeah you know when he used to go my mother's always talking about how when they were traveling the world going to Bangladesh or you know wherever all over the world and they'd be eating with the president and or you know the prince or the king or whoever and daddy would just disappear in the middle of the dinner and then they'd have to look and find him all over the palace he'd be you know where the where the help was or where he'd, be, cooks, in, he, he'd right. be in the, doing magic tricks for the staff you know so he, he, he just wants an average person he always wants to be taken to the neighborhood so he can get out and walk the streets and, and shake And Claire shows that well. Yeah, I thought that was does. really nice. That I don't think on all the yeah. documentaries, he did that all the time and no other documentary showed how he would want to, well back then we called, we didn't call them hoods, we called them ghettos. He'll be yeah. with the, the high and mighty all day and go, I'm tired of all these rich people, take me to the ghetto. Yeah, yeah. I want to see my people, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you captured that, you mm -hmm. know, in the film. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, Claire put that in there, it's yeah. great.
Even James Brown talks about it a little bit. How Jim he, Brown. Jim Brown talks about it. How he wanted to go down, you know, to, to, you know, yeah. to black neighborhoods or wherever the people are. Just talk to the people right. in the street. Uh, you obviously you know, can grasp the sort of praise that has been been made about your father over the years. Um, but when, when you hear a quote such as one of the greatest men of the 20th century, one of the greatest men of all times, of all time, is that ever something that can really sink in about your dad? He would say the greatest, <laughs> not one of. <laughs> no, yeah. Well, we grew up hearing it and knowing it, and we know why. A lot of times people, you know, are idolized and revered and respected for the wrong reasons, I think. And I think that people love and respect him for the correct, the right reasons, you know, the decency of him, the person that he was, his heart, his incredible faith and his, you know, self conviction, and they're all the right reasons. So yeah, it's but easy. In to private, he'll go, Allah's the greatest, God's yeah, the God's greatest, greatest, you know. Um, and we know he's a man, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. We know, I mean, we understand why he's so admired, but at the same time, we know he's not Superman. So yeah. we don't take it too seriously. I mean, yeah. we don't, I mean, Hannah, it's so interesting. I. I did a children's book of my father, and Hannah works with autistic youth, and I went to her class and did a book presentation, and one of her coworkers is taking pictures with us, and I'm like, Hannah, your coworker, they don't know our dad's Ali. She's like, no, I've been, I mean, we've worked at places and didn't even tell people who we were, because we don't think like well, that. Well, I learned my lesson working at a school, because the last school <laughs> I worked at, I couldn't get down the hallways afterwards. Yeah, the kids, you know? So, I don't tell people, I'm, even though I'm here before you and I'm comfortable doing this, I yeah. just like to see who people are. And uh, But when I was a little girl, I went around yeah. shouting it. Yeah. My daddy's Muhammad Ali. Yeah, <laughs> I, I never film. did. But he would sit us down and see. say, you know, the world's going to treat you better, they're yeah. going to treat you special, but you have to remember that nothing makes you better than anybody, not that house not the money not my fame it's just your heart so yeah. if you want to be better than anyone make sure you have a good heart so he taught us that Layla and I we used to go and get our five dollars and or whatever you know and try to look for homeless people because we saw him doing that and buying them food and <laughs> you know and I never understood why they wouldn't eat it but you know <laughs> no, wait, we just bought them cheeseburgers they're still there the bus stop but you know he he was such a great role model because he's such a decent human being and like she said he always says the world thinks he's Superman but he's not he's just a man and now he has Parkinson's and he thinks that's God showing everyone that he's just a man like everybody else and I think that he's just so extraordinary that people sometimes put him on this pedestal and even in the way he handled his faults you know he wasn't faithful he had kids out of wedlock and he didn't hide or hide us or you know all of his divorces were settled out of court he was more than generous with his wealth and he he brought us together he didn't hide anything you know he's he faces he faces the music you know that's a wonderful thing about him too and the way he handles his faults you learn a lot about a person Throughout the film, all of the interviewees use this phrase, this recurring phrase, born for greatness, as though it's inherent, it's, it's there from, from the outset. It's, it, he had a, a purpose, he has a purpose on this, on this earth. A lot of the films that you've done, uh, Che Guevara, uh, Audrey Hepburn, for example, you're, you're, you're looking at you know, these huge characters who it's almost as though <laughs> their lives could you know Hollywood couldn't write it? It's, 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 they were made for, for to be in a film. Um, d is there something that attracts you to these characters in particular? Well, I just, I just, if it's just certain people that you just think, well, you know, if you were in China or India or someone like that, you would recognise their face, like Che Guevara or Muhammad Ali or even Steve McQueen, perhaps. Yeah. And I just wanted to find out whether those people were just got lucky, and so I thought. Or were they really special? And so with your father, you know, and the more I got to listen to those tapes, the more I got to know about him, the more special I thought he was. And somebody said, did you discover what made him special? And I didn't really, because he loves doing these magic tricks all the time, but he used to tell people how to do it. But with Muhammad Ali, with all the stuff I've done, with all the research, I still can't put my finger on it. He's just, he is just special. He got kicked out of the Magicians Union <laughs> because he would show the tricks, because he doesn't believe in trickery. So even to us, he would perform a trick, and then he always has to show you how it was done. <laughs> he, was, he was in the Magicians Union. Well, he bought so many tricks, and on Hollywood Boulevard, they have, yeah, he joined it. He, he's, he loves, he loves, loves magic tricks and but always shows you how it's done afterwards <laughs> he's fascinated by how that. easily people were deceived so after that he true. did the trick he'll do a sermon go see how easily you are deceived watch the world it's the world an illusion deceive you. <laughs> the world is an illusion <laughs> maybe and how do you believe people are, are born for greatness um you know i i believe it's it's a uh, 50 50 i believe yeah, I believe we have free will and you're fo forks in the road and you can do certain things. You have to t make choices. He he stood up for his beliefs because he did that. Mm -hmm. No one made him do that. So I believe, yes, but at the same time, we choose how to be. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. We have to make a choice. So I'm a little bit on the fence on I'm a little bit nature nurture. 
It's funny because my dad, you know, he always says there's people all over the world taking stands every day, but nobody knows their name, so you don't hear about it. Right. I had a platform. I had boxing, so it gave me a voice. And he knew that he was here for some something special. He obviously came to Earth that way. You know, he had a little extra something in his spirit, and he just came to the Earth that way. Yeah, like as Rockman shares, my dad used to wake up when he was a little boy. He had this inner knowing, a cognizant knowing, and he couldn't put his finger on it, but he felt like he was born for do big things in the world. And he would sit outside and look up to the stars and wait for a revelation, wait for God to speak to him he, he would say and I said well what happened he said well I never heard nothing you know so then then his bike was stolen you know he went on the path and then people ask him well how do you get through life how do you, you face these challenges and have such amazing strength even with his illness and I remember when I was he used to say that he was like an ant and he said a lot of other ants know him and they follow him so God gives him some extra strength and that story that came about because I discovered him outside one day when I was a teenager and he was bent over and he was out there for like 15 minutes and I went upstairs came back and he was still out there I was like what is daddy doing so I went outside and he was following a trail of ants and that's when he said see this long trail of ants the majority of them have stopped some of them have ventured off but the majority the most of them are still following the ant at the head of the line I'm like that ant <laughs> lots of other ants know me they follow me so God gives me some extra strength <laughs> Well, he, he, he did have incredible strength and was uh, an incredible sportsman as well. We've talked about him being um, a loving father, a husband, a brother. Uh, we have a clip now of him as a fighter. It's interesting he made that statement because George Foreman, to me, became a better man after that fight. You know, he was a, a bully butch, you know, couldn't handle anything. And, and then he became this loving teddy bear. And as a matter of fact, he's so healthy, he, he preserved his body, stop, stopping the fight. And he's probably most successful financially with the Foreman grill. And yeah, yeah, my yeah. goodness. <laughs> so it, quitting yeah. helped him out. The clip that actually Claire uses in the film where my father's talking, he's jogging. He's, you don't hear George's voice, but my father's um, talking to George on the phone. In 1979, my dad was in Texas, and he was driving around, and out of nowhere, just like a clip in a movie, he spotted George Foreman on a dirt lot, standing on a cardboard box, preaching to the people in the middle of nowhere. He got out the car, started talking to him, and they exchanged, they exchanged uh, telephone numbers. George called my dad uh, the, the following month, and dad, of course, he's recording the conversation. And in that conversation, my dad is trying to convince George Foreman to come out of retirement and to come back and fight again, take back his title. And George is saying, no, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working for God now. I heard a voice, and he says, you know, you come to the ring and you'll be fighting for God, you know? <laughs> so that was part of their conversation she has the clip from. We're gonna throw the floor open for questions, so if you have any, please do start thinking of them. Um, I just have a, a couple more, if that's okay. As this clip uh, so well exhibits, the film has got an A soundtrack. How was, oh my goodness, how was that curated? How did that all come together? Um, music is my thing really, and the editor I work with, Reg Wrench, who I must say is a fantastic editor, and he, t t t t you know, we made the film together really. Um, and he and I just love music, and he does loads and loads of pop promos for big name people. And so I thought, because I didn't want the film to be just in a chronological order, which is a bit boring, really, I thought I can f flip back from different eras if I could use the music as a timeline. So you know when you've got the Jimi Hendrix track, or you know when you've got you know, the Aretha Franklin track, or you know, you know where you are. You know you're in Louisville in the 50s with the blues music. And so. Um, that was the one thing that Hannah thought, how is she going to do that as a white little white lady got sold. White lady okay. is gonna the, music, <laughs> the music is in this movie. I'm like, Claire, what? That's the one thing I yeah, said to Mamie. I was like, how is she going to nail the music? How does she know <laughs> about this? <laughs> <You gotta. laughs> Because I was wondering whether you'd taken tracks that, that Muhammad, you know, liked. No, or it's just, it's, uh, it, for me, it's kind of, it's like an instinctive thing. I always, I always, always edit to music. And I, I, the music is about the time, in this case, like, T placing where we are, but it's also the feel of the music. For instance, when w with the whole thing with George Foreman, when I interviewed him, I felt really bad because I was about to ask him, you know, <laughs> had a short period of time to interview him, what was your greatest defeat? You know, I thought, how can I come up to this? But he was very, very humble about it and said, you know, um, he was incredibly depressed. He, n he never ever thought he was going to lose. Nobody thought he was going to lose. In fact, he said he'd never lost. Whereas he said, with your father, he'd lost and he'd come back. And he didn't have that resilience. But that music, that BB... King track, the, the, you know, the through the my, It kind of just summed yeah. up that moment yeah. for me. One of my favorite parts in the film is actually something, a uh, footage that my dad isn't in, is the the civil rights montage. Yeah. I, I don't know if you guys saw the movie yet, but the the song, who is that singing? It's um, it's gonna sound really weird 
it's a soulful, soulful yeah, song. I want to download yeah. it, and it's just like it makes me just if I it say brings it chills. Stupid, it's basically, the track is called "Is It Because I Black." Yeah, <laughs> so it's, it's a yeah. great, great yeah, montage. Yeah. The civil yeah. rights yeah. montage is excellent. It, she just nailed so much of uh, like when we watch that film. It's like our dad's spirit is just oozing from it. Like the, the little things that she didn't even know. Like just the fact that there's a pink Cadillac flying down the street. He loved pink Cadillacs. To this day, he wants a pink Cadillac because Sugar Ray Robinson, his idol, had a pink Cadillac. So he got one. You know when he started fighting, but I, the fact that she did that even, I was like, wow, that was brilliant. So anyone in the family would know that, you know, but um, just because we know our father, he's so well, so he's gonna, he's gonna love that. It, it is so <laughs> ambient, and it's almost visceral, the tone of his voice and the timbre of it, it, it draws you in, and you feel like you know his character from the way it sounds and the way it feels, and everyone should see it, basically. Thank you, May May, Hannah, and Claire. It's, it's been great. I think we've gone way over time, yeah. but, but this has been brilliant. Um, thank you so much, and thank you also to everyone here at the Apple Store uh, for, for organizing this evening. Have a safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you.